are well better prepared to respond to emerging infectious disease outbreaks. What I really want to focus on here is the word prepare, especially when we're thinking about future priorities. So for those of you who don't know the Wellcome Trust very well, we're an independent global charitable foundation dedicated to improving health in all areas of biomedical sciences, predominantly through research. And we've been involved in responding to both Ebola and Zika in, in recent years, as well as preparing for future epidemics. And I wanted to share with you some of our experiences from Ebola and Zika, and then describe one aspect of um, our work in, in some detail, and this is CEPI the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. So I wanted to start with a quote, and I feel like I'm doused in yellow now. Um, so this is from George Santayana. Um, he's a Spanish philosopher and poet and novelist. So, um, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think this is very apt when thinking about epidemics and preparedness. So epidemics and pandemics, as we know, they're, they're not new. They're now potentially routine. If we just look at flu, we heard yesterday about the flu pandemics, the Spanish flu in 1918, 1957, and 1968. Um, what we do know is that a new pathogen jumps the species barrier roughly once a year, very roughly, and, and with severe consequences roughly every 10 years. So how, how have we learned from our past experiences and how do we use that to prepare for the future? So I'm going to start with our experiences in Ebola. And we heard from Beth Ann yesterday about some of the, the vaccines which have been developed for Ebola. We've heard a lot about Ebola, I know, but, and this profile will look very familiar to, to you. So that in black, it's monthly cases um, of Ebola and, and the cumulative cases in yellow. And, and in August 2014, um, the Wellcome Trust responded to the Ebola epidemic um, through supporting clinical trials for both vaccines and therapeutics. And our real focus here was supporting those trials of vaccines and therapeutics that would impact that current epidemic. However, when we got started, um, what we realized was that for the Ebola vaccines, very few of those vaccines had been through phase one clinical trials which meant that that was our starting point, that in um, autumn 2014, we had to start with the phase one clinical trials, which potentially delayed when our efficacy trials could be completed. And the fact of the matter is, phase one trials, safety trials, do not need to be completed within an epidemic. This can be done outside an epidemic in, in peace times, as, as we've heard um, over the last couple of days. So I do not want to take away from the amazing unprecedented partnership that, that led to um, the, the V920, the VSV vaccine, which Beth Ann talked about yesterday, um, being um, assessed and the efficacy trial being conducted so quickly. But I do believe we can do a lot better. And what we have learned at Wellcome is we need to be prepared and, and that allows us to act fast. So I also wanted to um, just touch on Zika, because Zika is a very different situation. Um, I have to admit, in November 2015, I hadn't really heard of Zika. I'm possibly not alone in this room, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Um, and, and it was a very different situation. We knew very little about the pathogen, we knew very little about the transmission dynamics, and we knew ver very little about the disease, and also very little about the implications of infection. So we couldn't advise the, the people on the ground, the people who were being affected by this. And, and the main difference is there were no reagents, there were no um, drugs or, or vaccines which were in the pipeline. So our, our thinking started from a research perspective. We need to find the answers to some of these questions. And what we learned again from this is we need to act fast and we need to work with others, we need to coordinate. So back to Ebola, because I think we can learn a lot from here. Um, in, in a way, the West African Ebola epidemic was unusual in that there were already hundreds of um, millions of, pa of dollars worth which had been invested in R&D over a decade. Also, there was a huge um, investment in humanitarian assistance. The outbreak lasted more than a year. That's a long time for these types of outbreaks. And there were approximately 30,000 cases. And importantly, there was widespread political support. And I want to move on to what happens next. So 
Ebola's happened. How can we learn from this? Well, there were many um, post-Ebola assessments and reports that were, that were written. You, you may be familiar with some of these. Um, and interestingly, they reached a very similar conclusion when it came to R&D, that we needed a new system for R&D, for research and development, for global response to health crises. And that's where I wanted to start talking about CEPI. CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. It was the first initiative to address the R&D recommendations for preparedness post Ebola. And it's, it, this new coalition was launched um, at the World, Economics, uh, World Economic Forum's annual meeting in January this year, which was exactly one year after the initial talks to establish the coalition were held in the same place. That's so very, very quick. And what is CEPI? So CEPI is a partnership of public, private, philanthropic and civil society organisations and it plans to stimulate, finance and coordinate vaccine development against priority threats and, and particularly when, it's, um, when development is unlikely to occur through market incentives alone. So that's really the space that it's interested in. So its investors, um, its initial investors included include Japan, um, Norway and Germany, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. After the launch of CEPI, um, Canada, Australia and Belgium, as well as an additional um, contribution from Norway um, joined. So, so now CEPI has approximately 620 billion, million, not billion, <laughs> oops, um, million dollars. And um, the European Commission also plans to co-fund with CEPI. So CEPI's really got two roles. Firstly, as a funder, and secondly, as a facilitator or coordinator. So as a, as a funder, it's really looking to fill what some people call a valley of death, from the end of preclinical to phase 2b. And that's where it's focusing its efforts. However, if, if the vaccines that it's developing really want to have an impact when the next epidemic occurs, it really ne CEPI really needs to be coordinated with the manufacturers and with those who are involved in delivery and stockpiling of vaccines. So that it knows that the vaccines it, it's developing, there is a path to the, the, those vaccines being used within the next epidemic. And secondly, from a downstream discovery perspective, CEPI doesn't, won't fund um, discovery, but it needs to know that there's a pipeline of potential vaccine candidates coming through, so it needs to be connected with the discovery end as well. So that's what I mean about it being a facilitator. And then how will it work? Um, so as I mentioned, CEPI will move vaccine candidates from late preclinical to proof of concept and safety in humans before epidemics begin. So it's really addressing the issue I raised earlier about phase one safety trials do not need to be done within an epidemic. They can be done beforehand. And this is a potential mechanism to help us become more prepared from a medical intervention perspective. And, and by doing this, um, CEPI will allow the larger effectiveness trials to begin swiftly in an outbreak um, and also ensure that, that stockpiles are ready um, for potential emergency use. In addition, w there, is, there are priority lists of pathogens um, which are seen to be of greatest threat to becoming the next epidemic. However, what is likely to happen is that a pathogen not on any list is, is likely to be the next epidemic, something we hadn't thought about, something that was, that's new. And therefore, as well as um, developing vaccines for known pathogens, CEPI is also building technical platforms and institutional capacity that can be rapidly deployed against new and unknown pathogens. And it's doing this through calls for proposals. There was an initial call um, against uh, vaccine targets for Nipah, Lassa and MERS-CoV. Um, and also there's a more recent one against technology platforms to enable rapid vaccine development and rapid scale up. So just to finish on, um, I wanted to put some conclusions down. So, so we know um, epidemics and pandemics will happen. Uh, we just don't know when or where, although we heard yesterday that we're getting better at predicting when and where they may, may occur. I don't think we've fine-tuned it yet. There's a lot to do. Um, we need to respect the biology. We need to respect the pathogen. And we need to use 
knowledge of the pathogen when it's available. And if it's not available, we need to find that out as quickly as possible to inform our decisions. Importantly, we need to be as prepared as we can. It's impossible to be completely prepared for every eventuality. That's not what I'm suggesting. And CEPI is an example of how we can be better prepared in the medical intervention sphere. That's not everything, it's part of the jigsaw, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, and importantly, we need to act fast, and the most important bit is acting together. We saw from, from the, the unprecedented partnership um, how we can work together when there's a common goal and a common theme, and I think this is really the take-home message to act together. And then, you may have seen this before, but I love this photo so much, I just wanted to end on it. It was taken in Liberia on the day the Ebola vaccine trial published its preliminary data showing that the vaccine was potentially effective. This girl comes from a family who was struck by Ebola and she wanted to thank science. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Please, any comments on this or questions for Charlie? Uh, you can just wait. We have someone in the back. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, with the CP, I just want to ask if uh, it's include uh, vaccine development in livestock. Its initial focus, it had to focus somewhere and its initial focus is human. There are so many needs. It needed to ensure that the the, the partnership model worked well before it started expanding. But if it does work well, it can expand beyond the humans. Mm -hmm. Any more thoughts? Oh, um, if it has enough money, sorry. If it, it has enough money, it will, it will <laughs> extend to animals too. Well, potentially. That's yeah. for SEPI to, to determine. You were talking about the gap filling, where, where the industry is not interested, SEPI could come in and work mm. with new vaccines. But those gaps seem to be enormous. How do you choose which gap to fill? So which, which um, yeah. pathogens to prioritize? Wh yeah, where to so, focus? So I'm gonna talk for CEPI, Wellcome Trust and not CEPI. So this is my yeah, understanding. Yeah, um, I understand and, that. And but so I know that, that CEPI um, has been working very closely with the WHO and um, WHO produced a blueprint which prioritized certain pathogens. But that list um, was based on um, pathogens where there were limited or no medical interventions, not specifically with vaccines in mind. So CEPI came in using that list and, and looked at the feasibility of vaccine development and where vaccines vaccines were appropriate, and that's how it decided on MERS, Lassa, and Nipper as a starting point. But you're right, there's so much need. How, how can you decide where to, where to act? What, where do you think the biggest challenge is within this? With, with CEPI achieving, well, there's scientific challenges. No, with um, the gaps, oh, the actually, gaps. between... <laughs> <laughs> well, Different, depending on which organization, which part of the world you, you are in, you have a different perspective and a different drive and a, a different strategy. So, you know, globally it's very different, but maybe within each organization, within each country, there are different priorities. So working together yes. <laughs> might mean that we can fill those different gaps together. Hi, uh, thanks for a very good presentation. I just had a quick one. Uh, you talked about vaccine development and Ebola, and I was just wondering, yesterday we heard from Dr. Kola about the vaccine being produced by Mark. Yeah. Uh, is there a connection between what you're doing and what uh, Dr. Kola and, and, and Co. are doing? Um, we supported some of the work which um, Merck, from, from Merck's perspective, the phase three clinical trial, we supported some of that work um, in a partnership again. Um, from a CEPI's perspective, I think a lot of the learnings from the Ebola um, and, and Merck's experiences have fed into um, how CEPI has developed and its business case. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie Weller. Big Thanks. applause.